Brazil, Spain, New Zealand. Governments around the world have disclosed detailed encounters with UFOs, some with occupants. America is more opaque. The Air Force has declassified thousands of Project Blue Book files, and journalists publish documents from the CIA and Navy, but there are gaps, such as in the entirety of outer space. Known as fast walkers, satellites have picked up anomalous objects in near-Earth orbit for decades. They sometimes appear on NASA live streams. In 1989, the Air Force let it slip that a database of them began in the 70s. Today, it still isn't public. That may be because NORAD, who analyzed them, remains exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Or because NASA is a figurative black hole. The agency steadfastly claims no astronaut has seen a UFO. Buzz Aldrin was taken out of context when he said an object followed Apollo 11, and this photo is just space junk. NASA has never declassified anything as much as a review of space anomalies. Other than Project Moonblink, a short-lived analysis of unusual lights on the surface of the moon that reached no conclusion. One would assume the agency that has managed all U.S. space exploration for 60 years has gathered more information. Could it be hiding in a little-known bureau inside the Department of State? The acronym is OES. That stands for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. It's one of many bureaus inside the State Department whose overall mission is to carry out U.S. foreign policy and international relations. OES, whose logo has an astronaut, elephant, and whale, is divided into nine offices, one of which is the Office of Space and Advanced Technology, SAT. OES, SAT, as it's written, is working with NASA to return astronauts to the moon and is also helping to build a space object registry that ensures commercial activity can operate safely. Is there any evidence, then, that OAS-SAT has analyzed UFOs? May 17, 1978. OES drafts a memo to the American Embassy in La Plaza, Bolivia on reports of a fallen space object. No direct correlation with known space objects that may have re-entered Earth's atmosphere can be made, it writes. We are continuing to examine any possibilities. They ask the embassy for more information on the number of objects and whether or not they had any markings on them. The paper trail stops there, aside from the CIA gathering local reports of people seeing a flying saucer squadron before the crash. Todd Zeckel, once editor for Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, asked NASA about the Bolivia incident, to which they referred him to OES. A colonel there said fallen space objects were within his purview and that the Bureau spent resources tracking them. This is quietly backed up by other documents, too. In 1976, OES was included in communication about space metal photographed in Canada and sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. That year, OES also received a report on a silver, luminous sphere seen over Morocco. In 78, the Bureau was emphasized in a confidential report on efforts to have the UN investigate UFOs. And in 79, OES and NASA received intel that officials in Kuwait were unsure if objects of extraterrestrial origin were observing oil refineries. It's becoming clearer after our review that OES may be a repository of sorts for UFO information inside the State Department. This is backed up by other files, too. Such as here, when two women claimed to have a message for President Jimmy Carter from outer space, were referred to OES. Or here, when the Bureau wrote Eric von Doniken, thanking him for a copy of his book In Search of Ancient Gods. The author, known for popularizing the ancient astronaut hypothesis, 
wrote the White House expressing his support for the expansion of manned space travel. OES replied, saying it was committed to escalating space exploration. Less overt references to the Bureau were published by WikiLeaks too, such as this cable sent to House member Bill Archer titled, Arrangements to Welcome Extraterrestrial Life Forms to the U.S. Metadata shows the file originated from OES, though no text body was leaked. The Bureau also approved communications on joint U.S.-Soviet space biology experiments that originated from NASA. They analyzed everything from astronaut physiology to how plants behave in space. This has been public for 40 years, though lesser known was OES's role. And really, that's the story here. Despite being a federal bureau, there is little media coverage of it. Our question is, how much of that is by design? This FOIA request in 1982 shows the State Department looked for UFO records in several places, but a search of OES was never finished. If there is an institutional desire to obfuscate these files, particularly those related to NASA, one would only need to put them in an office where people wouldn't think to look. In 2018, the White House published Space Policy Directive 3, calling for a new space traffic management system to track everything in orbit around Earth. And that may be what pushes another round of disclosure by, say, the mid-2020s. Anomalous objects in space may need to be made public for safety reasons. OES has other responsibilities, too. One office inside it protects marine wildlife. Another, the preservation of Antarctica. Congressional records show a high-ranking senator once took issue with why the Bureau classified meetings to decide the continent's status as an isolated scientific preserve. Remember, the State Department's mandate is to oversee how the U.S. interacts with others outside of its borders. OES is simply responsible for issues far beyond the border, in outer space. What do you think? Could the Bureau's Space Object Registry System include anomalies? Several minutes of the S-30 video. I basically moved each frame, and you can see the frames actually moving now, showing the degree that I had to move the image in order to keep this object stable in the center. The stabilized image clearly shows the odd shape of the object shifting and turning in the sky. I then took the numbers one by one and reconstructed the flight path. And that's the only way I could determine what the actual motion was. And I recreated that in three dimensions. It's initially heading away from the camera and it, it abruptly changes. And during this phase, the range is increasing. It's actually going away from the camera. And at this point, it changes direction. Wind wouldn't do that. It wouldn't change that abruptly. And it wouldn't follow a constant radius throughout this entire portion here. It's all at constant uh, distance from the camera. It's as if it's observing the ground position just as the ground is observing it and maintaining this constant uh, distance. Based on his knowledge as an aerospace engineer, Peterson offered one possible explanation for the abrupt turns performed by the UFO. You could interpret it as if it determined it was on radar at this point. Perhaps it, uh, if, if you're on radar, of course, you can sense that in all of our fighter planes. You know when you're being tracked. As soon as you get a lock or you, you get this radar signal, it would seem to me that this object was interested in who's, who's observing it. And it turned in order to find out. When something starts to change shape like that in the air, you become very, very are puzzled because you realize that you're looking at something that appears to involve a whole new technology that we don't understand. What you want to do, of course, is go and find the person who's invented this and say, whatever made you think of that and what does it do and how does it do it? <laughs> but we will probably never know who created this new technology. Questions about the earthly or otherworldly origins of the Nellis UFO are unanswerable. Until the mastermind behind this craft comes forward, there is only speculation and fear. It's like uh, us viewing an ant farm. And the ants think they're it. That's the scary part.